Hi, everybody. Testing. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And uh, we've got a special guest with us today. Not special like short bus special. Special like, oh, I like her the best. Welcome. <laughs> it's an answer man here with <laughs> us today, everybody. Wow. I'm Marshall Lee. Oh, Marshall Latham. Sorry, I got them confused. That's right. Marshall Latham, late of the Journey Into podcast, and uh, with whom I do the Delusions of Grandeur podcast. Or has that died as well? Not yet. Oh, wait. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Marshall uh, is in town. So we came up to visit him. We're sitting in his hotel room. This is a... That gets my goat on the go, I guess. <laughs> we're, we're in his hotel room, and we're just hanging out. We thought we'd... <laughs> <laughs> there, now it's on, on the go. I tried to make this sound go away. <laughs> and we, we thought we'd uh, just discuss some, some things with Marshall while, while he's here, and hopefully it's interesting. We make no guarantees. That's right. So something that I had always wanted to ask you, and then I did ask you, but we weren't recording, and so I'm going to ask you again, is you're Marshall Latham. You're not Toby Terwilliger or Cactus Dan or anything like that. You use your real name, and from the very first time that we met you, you use your real name. And, I, I, and there, I, there have been some people that would produce for us, and they'd be like, do not call me by my real name. You know, this is the name you shall refer to me as. And uh, for various reasons, I can imagine people saying, you know, I'm going to use a stage name, I'm going to use a pseudonym on this. Or, but you didn't. From the very beginning, you were just like, hey, this is me. Like it or lump it. Black is beautiful. Love it or list it. What he said. And I, anyway, I just wanted to ask you about that, if that has ever been a problem, if you ever regret making that decision. You know, to be honest, when I started, I, I didn't even think about it. I just figured, hey, I'm doing a podcast. So I introduced myself and went that went on that way. I don't know if it's really ever been a problem, per se. Sometimes, maybe as more of the things that I want to write, you know, sometimes I think of like a horror-type story. I'm like, well, I would never want to put my name on that, you know. Somebody read that, or my kids read that, you know, and think, wow, that's kind of dark, you know, or wow, what was he thinking here, or uh, things like that. So I thought, well, maybe if I ever wrote like a darker story or something, I could make up a pseudonym that I published any kind of horror stories underneath. But as far as podcasting, you know, I never, uh, I never thought about having a pseudonym. Um, since I have thought about, well, you know, I tell people where I live and I tell them my real name and when my kids do parts, I tell them my kids' name and maybe that's not the best thing to do over the internet. Yeah, that was kind of the main re or one of the main reasons why I am known as Big Anklevich and nothing else. And my children, I make sure that no, we never, when they're on my show, I never actually give somebody a name. Actually, when we do cast list, we don't even mention them usually yeah and i don't put their names into the credits or any of that kind of stuff just mainly it was for that kind of reason i mean i don't expect it to happen i don't expect to have some stalker that's going to obsess with my daughter's voice or something and hunt her down and do something awful but i figured it's better to be safe than sorry you know i don't expect it it's not likely to happen not likely to get struck by lightning but i don't go out with a key held in the air during a storm or something you know I don't, I don't fly a kite with a key attached to the end of it during a storm but yeah it was just kind of that thing I, I i i've said before that i work in news and news anchors they get a lot of weird stalker weirdos after them we get a, a few of those every now and then that you know they're like getting this guy's picture and putting it up outside the door and saying hey if you see this guy do not let him in mm. and i don't want that possibility for me i'm not a hot you know young news anchor so i don't have to worry too much about that but you never know i mean uh, weird crap happens and yeah that did, just did kind of make me a little nervous so i figured it'd be smart to do that and on top of that i want to keep that world separate from like my job and stuff like that i don't right. want my boss to be able i don't have my boss on facebook as a friend Although a lot of people have done that. When Facebook first became big, this station really wanted everybody to promote, the, you know, our product on Facebook. And they made us 
friends with the station and all this kind of stuff. And I don't have anybody whatsoever from work as a Facebook friend, even for my real name. I don't do that. I just, I don't want the possibility of me saying something dumb by accident or something. And then my boss sees it and then, yeah, you know, it colors the rest of my time working there. And maybe it makes the rest of my time working there very short, uh, something <laughs> right. like that. I, I wanted to avoid that all along. So that's the other reason I didn't want if my boss Googled my name for it to come up in connection with the show. Yeah, we've all heard stories of somebody who, you know, types, you know, I friggin' hate working at Burger King and my boss is a Caucasian man and F them. And, uh, and then they, they lose their jobs because they've typed in a public forum something negative about their employer and, uh, and it never even occurred to them that their employer or somebody connected to the employer might read that. Um, and you, uh, I recently I had you do a story where, uh, I believe you used the term cock knocker. Oh, no, no, no. And I thought, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't have made Marshall do that. Maybe I should have made Toby Terwilliger do that. Is that something that you ever worry about? Because there's always going to be different mixed content on your show. Right. And let's say uh, that somebody, you know, the gold bug had some potentially offensive stuff in it. And you were going to read the part of Jupiter. Right. And, you know, here I am, Marshall Latham, coming to you from base camp in Intercourse, Pennsylvania. And... Uh, is there is there any worry about that kind of stuff? So I'm just like, ooh. Not too much on a like a personal level, but then again, you know, I I was probably naive, especially when talking about my kids and, and things like that. But as far as um, people being mad at me because I did something on the show, that's fine if they want to be upset with me for. Now you're a religious guy, right? I am. You go am. to church, and you even talk about like your faith and stuff on your show sometimes. Yeah. And then you run some stories that some religious folks might think, hmm, I don't know if this guy's actually a righteous man after all. Do, do, do the people from your church even know you have a podcast and know... To listen, do you know somebody that listens to your show personally? <laughs> I know. Well, there's a couple from work that I know that listen to it. People at church, I tell them, you know, they say, oh, what do you do? What's your interests and hobbies? And, uh, you know, so I tell them I do audio editing and I do a podcast and things like that. But they usually just go, oh, that's interesting. Uh -huh. And they don't say, oh, what is it? You know, I'd like to hear right. that kind of thing. So um, you don't expect them to ever... They might look yeah. at you askance one day from across the pew and be like, that Marshall Latham, <laughs> you're in that really creepy bunny suit story. <laughs> or the story where the guy rips his own heart out at the end of the story. Right, yeah. right. Stories like things like that. You know, it's funny because all growing up, I would hear stories about Stephen King. Stephen King was possessed by the devil. That's how we got all these ideas. He was possessed. And I would read the stories of Stephen King, and then I would think, you know, this actually s sounds a lot kind of like story ideas that I've had. <laughs> oh, really? You're putting two and two together? And so I was just like, why would they say this guy's possessed by the devil? Obviously, I'm not possessed by the devil. Right. You know, you don't have to be some freaking devil person to come up with a horror story idea. It's... You just have to be creative is all it takes. I don't know. It would upset me that they would, you know, say things like, oh, yeah, well, he must be possessed by the devil. And I remember when I first started writing stories and stuff, they were almost completely really ho uh, creepy horror story kind of stories. And I would share them with my sister, and she was afraid to read them. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> she... She would. She read a couple of them. She's like, "Oh, your stories always creep me out." So, and so she she didn't want to read them anymore. And I wondered if she thought if she looked at me askance, like, oh, "This brother of mine is writing some really weird, creepy stuff. What's wrong with my brother? Is he, you know, I don't know." It just mom, seems, mom, have you read this? <laughs> it just seems like the kind of thing that you might get in that environment. Yeah, yeah. and I don't know. Uh, I like just being out there, you know, being myself and mm -hmm. and not trying to, you know, hide behind anything, you know, just kind of, this is who I am, you know. There is a story that's upcoming on uh, Journey Into that has a homosexual relationship in it. It's not about homosexuality, but there's definitely a homosexual relationship in it. So I, I, I 
curious, or I'm interested to see if anybody ever hears that or says anything to me about that. If somebody calls you on it? Yeah, or just says, oh, why did you do that story or whatever? You know? Uh-huh. But for that story in particular, it was, more, it was more about the story than that element of it for mm-hmm. me. So putting it on the podcast isn't too big of a, a deal, but I, you know, I could see somebody from church reading that and saying, what's going on here kind of thing. But, but again, I, I guess ultimately... You know, I, it's my decision as an editor of my podcast to do put whatever on there, you know. Right. So. And, yeah, that's admirable. I, I, I like that. I think when we first came up with this whole podcast thing, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, hey, this is an opportunity to start fresh and make a persona. He can be whatever I want him to be. And ultimately, he's just me, <laughs> unfortunately. But let's say that you had, like, a really ghastly really, you know, chilling idea for a short story, would it come out differently if you wrote it as, you know, whatever you want to say your your phony name is? Toby Terwilliger? Would, would you censor Why? yourself a little bit more if it's Marshall Latham is writing this, or would you have a freedom with a, a pseudonym? I probably would have more freedom. Not that I would do anything, you know, crazy or whatever, but I do kind of, as I'm if I'm writing something... I do f- feel a little bit nervous about, you know, this. I'm putting my name, I, this is my byline on the story. And so, you know, a lot of people don't understand writing. I think we all do. That just because you write something doesn't mean that's who you are or what you think. You're trying to develop characters. You're trying to put forth things. And if this guy's a, a racist or this guy, you know, does something that's terrible, it doesn't mean, oh, I've been thinking those. Well, obviously, I've been thinking about those, but not to do them personally. But not everybody reads it that way. They think, oh, he must really have that going on in his brain or whatever. So I think if I were to write a a really dark story or something, I probably would use a pseudonym for it as a writer to do that. Yeah, see, that's the hard thing. You know, when when we first started the show... I still wanted to write everything under my real name. I still, I don't know what it is. I I think maybe it's just like someday somebody that I knew growing up or something will come across my book on the shelf and they'll see my name and say, hey, I knew that guy, or at least I knew a guy by that name. Maybe it's the same guy. And then they'd open the back cover and see there was no picture and be like, ah, well, I guess I'll have to read the whole thing and spend the $20 for the book. Um, No, I don't know what it was, why I, I... felt that I needed to put it under my own name, but that's kind of changed since we've been going along, especially since there's probably way more people now that know me as Big Anklovich right. than anybody that ever knew me as... Especially in writing and podcasting circles. Right, yeah. right. People that are after stories and stuff like that, they already know Big Anklovich and would think, oh, well, I heard that guy's podcast and I'll you know check out his story, but if I wrote under a pseudonym... Yeah, there would they, there would be no recognition, and so they would not necessarily bother to pick that up and check it out. And that's one of those things uh, Cory Doctorow always said. You know, he he does all his stuff as Creative Commons because these days a writer is much more likely has much higher danger of being just completely unknown and never doing anything than having his stuff stolen and losing all sorts of money from that. Right. Uh, yeah, obscurity is much bigger danger for a writer than pirating. Yeah, I mean, that's the same kind of thing. You don't want to push yourself into obscurity by changing your name every time you write a story so nobody ever is able to track you down, follow you along. So, yeah, it's kind of one of those things that I've kind of decided that it, it, I guess it's time to uh, to publish under that pseudonym rather than my real name with anything and even things that i've you know put out in the past under other pseudonyms or or so forth i'm just gonna axe those pseudonyms and you know when i put it out the next time or whatever it will be under my actual name or sorry it will be under this name (laughs) big anklovich rather than any other pseudonym that i might have there was a time when i thought you needed a different pseudonym for every different genre you know if you're gonna write horror story well they're going to want the, the horror guy and if you you don't want people to confuse where they see the the guy that they know from horror to pick up a story and find out it's a love story oh my gosh this is the worst thing ever 
But you know, I think a lot of that comes from the marketing world. You know, the the publishers and the advertisers for your book or your stories or whatever would say, "Hey, you don't want your books, you know, being on different areas of the bookstore." But you know, now everything's going online, and that's maybe not as big of a deal. But I think that's where that came from. Was you want people that like horror to go to the horror section and recognize your pseudonym for horror or whatever. Right. I was looking up just before we uh, started talking. You know, the only person that I am really familiar with that, that does it is Daniel Abraham. He writes in several different genres, mostly fantasy, but he writes um, science fiction as well. I think under James S.A. Corey. And then I think his gets his horror that he writes under M. L. N. Hanover. But I don't know. It's M. L. N. M. L. N. Hanover. I'm I'm actually going to make my pseudonym for horror L. M. N. O. <laughs> Hanover. That's a lot of initials. That's like a J. R. R. Tolkien. Yeah. Or a George George R. R. Martin. R. Does, but do you know why he chooses the three? Is it for that reason of marketing? I, yeah, I think I've heard him talk about that and that it is about marketing. But why not just have fans say, wow, this guy's multi-talented. This guy can write fantasy and horror. And science fiction. And science fiction. And his, his fans are really going to say, you got your peanut butter in my chocolate. Hey, you got your chocolate in my peanut butter. And you got some Vegemite over there. I don't you know, know what who that's who would about. really like this? <laughs> Noah. Let's go show it to him. Oh, as soon as the rain stops. <laughs> now, you were telling me the other week that you had, you sent an email off to Dean Wesley Smith asking him about pseudonyms and, and purpose behind it. Well, yeah, uh, prefacing that, you know, I have works out there under different names, and now I've been reading books for Audible.com. And every once in a while, you get like a really dirty book. The, the intellectuals call it erotica, but we all know what we're talking about. Smut. Smut, that's right. And I had to make a decision on that. If, or what, I mean, the first decision you make is, are you going to read smut? But it, let's assume that you are, that you love smut. I mean, who doesn't? All of us here love smut. And so you read that, but I had to decide, am I going to use my real name? Or am I going to make up a pseudonym for that? And ultimately, I just felt like, well, okay, I'm going to do a pseudonym for anything that's like really over the top explicit. And I don't know if that's the right choice to make. I, I think at one point you had told me, just have it all be under Rish Outfield. You know, screw them if they can't take a joke. Well, I don't know if I ever said to do the smut all under one name. I think I did try and tell you to do everything else under one name. I think it's probably a good idea to keep the smut in a separate world. In a separate world. And that's fine. But it, Stephen King used to tell this story about the Beatles, that once the Beatles, were, around 1964, 65, were so well known, they couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't go to a foreign country. They couldn't go into a, a bar and just sit down and have a drink. And John Lennon got it into his head that, why don't we wear masks? Why don't we go to some honky-tonk or whatever they had in England and and we'll and we'll perform as like the masked marauders or whatever, and we'll just we'll be able to try out our new songs and all that stuff without being you know attacked by and people fainting and screaming, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and we could see which songs work and which ones are you know are, are not working and all that objectively and George Harrison said we could try that, but thirty seconds into the first song, they would know it's us by the way we play our instruments. And Stephen King said, that, was likening that to writing under a pseudonym. And the thing is, if anybody listens to one of my smut readings, 30 seconds in, they're going to know it's me if they know my voice. Right. Right? Right. But I think the smut reading under a different name will keep the people that... <laughs> I don't know, the people that still respect you in some way or another from stumbling upon that by accident. Because the thing is, you can Google words that are on a page, such as a name of whoever is, you know, the reader of the story. That will come up if we search Rich Outfield. All the times that you were Rich Outfield will come up in the Google search. But Google can't search an audio file and tell you, oh, this is also Rich Outfield. It says something else, but... 
Yeah, I can see that, you know, where somebody's like, oh, I like Bruce's narration. I'm going to, here, what else has he done? And it ends up being Lust of the Ladies or something <laughs> like that. And they're thinking, oh, I didn't know he read that. Oh, that changes or, my opinion. Or, it's a, or I don't the know. other side of that, it's a ubiquitous title. And they think, oh, that sounds interesting. And then they start listening and it's yeah, not ubiquitous. Well, do you think that, that that's a good choice then? That think, for erotica, it's it's a, a, a another name. But let's say that I wanted to take it a step further, and anytime I'm reading a YA novel, it's going to be Tony Terwilliger, who's Toby's cousin. Is there any benefit in that? The, when I'm reading, you know, horror or sci-fi or whatever, or fantasy, I'm Rich Outfield, but when I'm reading YA stuff, romance novels, it becomes Toby Terwilliger. You know, it's a, it's an interesting. I guess it's a something that you have to decide one way or the other. Because I think it goes back to that whole obscurity is the enemy of somebody, and you want people to be able to follow your trail. I want to say that Dean Wesley Smith was saying that you should just all your stuff should be under the same name, and I think even he said except erotica because that's a different animal. But uh, it should all be under the same name, and people should be able to tell by the description of the story and the style of a cover or et cetera, et cetera, what kind of a story it is, so they won't accidentally read one of your stories that they would despise. They just look at it and go, oh, well, this one looks good. Oh, crap, this is a romance novel. Ah, why didn't they tell me? <laughs> I thought I could trust Rich Outfield, and now I hate him. But well, see, that's a funny... That's taking it in a different direction. Not that they heard me say the C word or whatever in a story, and it's like, oh, this guy's a scumbag. But that they heard me go, oh, yeah, I've never loved anyone as much as I love you, to Toby Terwilliger. <laughs> and, uh, and they're just like, oh, geez, I thought this guy was above this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's just a question that I've never really had answered, and... You know, it's sort of, we had a recent experience where it sort of told, taught me this thing, that there are people out there that can't separate what a character says in something that you write from the writer's own attitude. Um, we've got one of those, you remember when we did the barbecue sketch last year of the three guys that are all talking about their how great their marriages are? Well, I wrote one just as kind of a, a lark. Where each guy is pretending to be, not pretending, each guy is like more open-minded and more liberal than the guy next to him, you know. I mean, it's just like a super, super, you know, it's kind of like the, the, uh, Colbert report. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Where they're lampooning what's said on the far right. But they say it, you know, just like, go, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, Anyway, from what happened a couple weeks ago with a story where I wrote where the, I thought that where there was a joke and for some reason the joke wasn't taken as a joke. It was taken as some kind of political stance. It makes me worried about this barbecue sketch where basically I'm just saying Democrats are dumb and Republicans are the way to go. And you say it with that accent, I think people got to know I'm joking. But maybe not. I'm sorry, I'm offended. <laughs> That's right. It was just a roundabout way of me just talking about myself. Can, can you guys? Can you guys go, please? <laughs> I don't. Well, hey, you were there. You, you, yeah, you no, were. Were you part of that one, or you were just in the audience? I was that? just in the audience for that one. All right, do you think there's any potential for for misunderstanding in that? I don't know. I mean, it's a comedy sketch. I don't. I don't know if people take that as serious as as they would if you were just trying to write a, something serious about something. But everybody in that room was was laughing about it, even though you know they may be from that political view. They were able to laugh at that extreme liberalness of, of that. I, think, but, yeah, I guess we'll see. I guess uh, it yeah. remains to be seen. It's not to come out for several months still, so we've got time. There's another barbecue sketch that we also recorded that will be coming uh, before that one. And Marshall actually is in that one. Yeah, yeah. But you and I had made a rule early, early on that we weren't going to do any stories that were... Was it stories or just a conversation? Uh, I think it was stories and conversation. A story that was 
trying to push political points, uh, you know, a, a political diatribe disguised as a story, or a religious evangelism or anti-evangel, whatever you want to call it, in either of those kind of things disguised as stories either as well. Either mocking or right, pushing right. religion. Right. Just because it's so divisive, religion and politics are the two most divisive things, I think. And uh, I obviously that stuff has still crept in from time to time. Uh-huh. But it's just the, the, the reaction to that story was shocking to me because if you've ever listened to the Doonstief, you got to know which side of the political barometer I fall on or, or we fall on. Again, it just made me wonder if this person knew us or and and surely we've said more offensive things <laughs> on every <laughs> single episode. But well, yeah, it was just a recent story that I wrote, and it, it was a joke. It wasn't meant to be a but even that you know some people think this, and I think that they're right. It was meant to make people laugh. Well, and, and do you think people, if your joke had gone the other way politically, do you think anybody would have cared or anybody would have said anything? Only Clay Duggar. <laughs> and I, Clay's got a pretty thick skin. He seems, uh, for most things, to be able to ha- to open his mind a little bit, I think. I mean, is that, was that a terrible thing to say? Should I not have said that? I think that's okay to say as a thick skin. Um, but this is all tied to, okay, I wrote that as myself. This is my name, and you know that we are the hosts of the show. And so that influenced somebody that was just like, oh, the guy who wrote this story must think this. But years and years ago, I realized that if you have a character that's in a story that's racist or a murderer or, you know, a, a, a psycho or, or, or gasp old, it doesn't mean that you're racist or a murderer or even old. Uh, and that anybody reading a story has to understand that, that, that you, if you're writing a spy novel and you got good guys and bad guys, you're not all of those things, right? Yeah, I would think so. I would think people should be able to understand. Maybe some people just think, oh, the, the good guy is the one that you identify with and that guy's like you or something like that. I don't know. You know, one time I went to a... There was a thing where James Patterson was coming to my local bookstore, and so I went to listen to what he had to say and have some books signed and stuff. And he was talking about a time where he went to a book signing. It wasn't obviously in Sacramento because there's not enough uh, ethnic diversity for this. But, you know, he writes those Alex Cross books. Sure, yeah. And he's an African-American protagonist. Yeah, what he describes... I think in his own description of Alex Cross, Alex Cross would be like a young, young Denzel Washington. You know, that's how he imagines him, how he kind of writes him and stuff like that. And so he said that he showed up, and I don't know where it was, but, you know, somewhere where there was a decent African-American population. He showed up at the, the reading or the signing, and there was all these young black women hoping to see somebody that was like Alex Cross show up. To sign the book, and then yeah, and they were pretty disappointed when this old, funny-looking white dude walked in, and uh, they're just like, "Oh, misrepresentation." So maybe that's a lot of what people do. Maybe they kind of think that the author sympathizes or is like the main character of his books. I don't know. I'm sure that I don't know. Do you ever do that when you are reading a book? picture what the author might look like and then you realize no not that it's just a fat white guy with a beard dang it not a fat white guy with a beard again well Every sometimes time. especially if a writer is writing in the first person and right. it's like i remember my time in georgia growing up or what you know what i mean then you start to have a character be created in in your mind but i, I don't know i think that's a character of a good writer somebody that can look at something from a different perspective than their own and to sell it as the the attitude of the character of the book. Yeah, I guess and that... I, I've heard you in your stories talk about both sides. Yeah. You know? Well, I worry because I do have stories that are religious in nature, whether that's pro-religious... Well, the calling, depending on how you look at it, is either pro-religious or real anti-religious. And I, I think somebody could argue either way. Yeah. Uh, because I clearly, like, the power of God is at work in that story. But the main character is super against that. And so I think you would hold it up but for that, either. 
that worked well in that story, especially with the fight between the brother and the sister, because they were both coming at it. And that, I love that part of that. Well, I, I'm glad that you did, but I have some that aren't balanced like that. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. There are some where clearly the priest is a piece of crap. And then there are some where it's like, hey, clearly God's hand was at work in this. There's no denying that kind of thing. And those I'm always afraid to publish. Uh, you know, it's like, should, maybe I should use a, a, a pseudonym on that. You know, you'll hear about Stephen King is, is super anti-religious. Oh gosh, that guy hates religion because like Carrie White's mom was a religious fanatic or something like that, or there was a corrupt preacher in the dead zone. But like Mother Abigail in the stand was an instrument of God. She spoke to God and he worked his, you know, he, he saved the world through her, right? Mm -hmm. But nobody ever holds that up. It's just, it's easy to grab the negative and say, that's what this thing means or is, right? Yeah, I think it just kind of depends on the person. People will grab the thing that they think matters to them, you know what I mean? And if that, that's what they expect of you, or that's what they want of you, or maybe that's just what they care about, then that's what they'll you know, grab that and hold up and say, see, look at this, see, I told you. And yeah, that's that's going to be dangerous. Uh, one more extension of this is uh, one thing that your wife said to you, I, uh, and then you told me, and then I could never let it die because that's <laughs> that's who I am. And you got to not tell me things that your wife says. But she didn't like a particular writer's books because she felt that he this, it wasn't it didn't sound genuine when he would write women. This is a man writing a book, giving a voice to women, but you could tell that it was a man. You know what I mean? He didn't understand women. He didn't talk like women talk. And she didn't want to read this guy's books about women. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. So what if you're writing romance and you're a dude? Do you pick a female name for your pseudonym? Is, is that going to make it more palatable? Or is a woman and, and and let's just be honest here. If a woman sees two identical books, and one has a male writer on the cover and one has a female writer, is she more likely to get the female one? Mm, that's kind of like a reverse of you know women trying to break into print by using a man's name or initials or whatever. Or J K. Right, things like that had been going on for a long, long time. But I think it's only natural. For a woman to say, well, a woman wrote this, so she's going to understand what makes me excited. She's going to understand what I long for better than a man is going to understand, right? Is, isn't it only natural that someone would feel that way? Or am I Probably. weird? I think I it is natural, that. and I think it is the case. I mean, if you look at romance writers, and I've seen, I want to say that I saw this on Dean Wesley Smith's blog, but I'm not really sure. I did read a great deal of his publishing cows the sacred cows. Say, killing the cacred sows. Yeah. The cacred sows of <laughs> publishing. Um, it was the Kama Sutra, ladies and gentlemen. That's what he was reading. Yeah. And I just made that other stuff up. I think he talked about that whole thing with romance writers. Now, there's a few, very few writers of romance that are men. And I think that they, at least to begin with, used pseudonyms. Or maybe they should pick like a androgynous <laughs> name or something. Yeah, just another JK thing. But is that going to help you in the same way that your name is Charles and you change it to Charlene? Charlize. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, it's a strange question. Um, I guess you probably have to make a decision ahead of time. Am I ever going to try to cross these worlds together? And do I ever want anybody to know that I'm writing as... Jane Smithers when my real name is John Smothers. Or Excellent like Smithers. <laughs> <laughs> that gets my goat. We'll be continued next time. Good. Run while you still can. That gets my goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Sad but true. And do you mind if I tell the thing that your wife said that I always bring oh. up, that I even brought up today? Sure. <laughs> Were you assigned to James Patterson? I did assign him? it to James Patterson. I was going to say, I didn't get to say, maybe I should change my impression of James Patterson, therefore, if he managed to dupe all these women into thinking that he was a strapping young black man. That's right. James Patterson a, is famous for saying, King Kong ain't got nothing on me. He might be a better uh, uh, writer than I gave him credit for.